in the last few lectures we have focused on design of a very specific component of the processor namely ALU or arithmetic logic unit. Uh, now, we are going to look at the overall processor design where this would be the key component, but we need to add uh, more pieces of hardware to make the whole processor complete. So, first of all we will talk about uh, uh, the building blocks, what are the other blocks including ALU which are required to build a processor and uh, we will start with a very simple design where uh, we will simply put these uh, building blocks together in the simplest possible manner and see how the data would flow, what is the data path and how it is controlled. Uh, then we will see the performance of this particular design and we will realize that we need to do something more to get a better performance. We will therefore, move over to a little more involved design, more sophisticated design which is called a multi cycle design. This term multi cycle will be explained as I go along and again we will see the two major parts data path and control. Uh, then we will see a very specific style of designing the control called microprogrammed control where essentially one very small low level program is trying to control the overall processor. And uh, finally, we will enhance our design to handle what is called exceptions. So, uh, while we were talking of instructions, we talked of things like overflow okay. and uh, there are many other situations which are exceptional situations which are not normal and then the design has to take care of these situations. So, first we will ignore these and uh, then enhance the design to accommodate these. In particular, uh, today we will first begin with uh, taking a set of instructions from uh, MIPS architecture which we are going to implement. So, that uh, it, uh, the design we talk of is a very simple manageable design we can understand, discuss and understand in the class and uh, look at overview of the design, okay. what, what is the outline, what is the basic idea, uh, see how it is divided into data path and the control, uh, then go on to description of the building blocks. So, we will see that there are two types of building blocks combinational and sequential. Uh, we will look at the issue of uh, clock which times the whole design and uh, see what are the timing constraints a particular clock frequency puts on the design or given a design what kind of clock frequency you can expect it to have. Uh, so, finally, we will see the components which are very specific to MIPS. Uh, initially, the initial discussion would be components in a generic sense and uh, then we will talk of something which is required to specifically build MIPS which has to carry out uh, these particular instructions. Okay. So, starting with uh, what instructions we want to begin with, these are the instructions we learnt right in the beginning. Okay, so, we will take those few instructions and try to work out the design. So, these are now we have to be very, very, very specific because uh, we need to build circuit which will actually do uh, those particular instructions. So, let us take add, subtract, and or and SLT. So, two arithmetic instructions, two logical instructions, and one comparison instruction. Then we will take the two memory reference instructions load word and store word, uh, two control flow instructions branch if equal and jump. Okay. So, one is a conditional branch which uh, has a simple comparison. So, SLT has a little more com complex comparison as now you would realize that uh, after having discussed comparison and ALU circuits that com comparison for equality is simpler as compared to comparison for less than or greater than. Uh, one, one simple thing uh, is that when you are comparing for equality, uh, there is no flow of information across the bits. Okay. You, you look at each bit separately and uh, check if the corresponding bits of two operand let us say A and B are equal uh, and then individual results could be combined. Whereas, if you are doing a comparison for less than then uh, either you do by subtraction where a carry flows through okay, or you do direct comparison in which case also 
uh, there was some information flowing. So, you, you, we had written uh, a recursive equation describing the comparison operation. So, a, a simple comparison like e equality test uh, is combined possibly with branch as in BEQ. <coughs> okay, so, after looking at the design which caters for these uh, let us say 5 plus 2 plus 2, uh, 9 instructions. So, these 9 instruction processor uh, would have a simple design, but we will notice that uh, additional instructions can be added to this design by making small incremental changes here. Okay, so, in, in many cases the changes will be indeed small in some of course, depending upon the nature of instruction. If you want to add an instruction which is too diverse from what we have, the change may be little larger, but uh, once you have the overall uh, structure, overall outline of the design, then adding other things uh, is comparatively easier. So, probably that discussion will be in tutorials. Okay. So, uh, what is the overall approach? How, how do we uh, intend to implement a processor design? So, we use a register or a counter. Uh, which we call PC, which will supply address of the instruction to be executed. So, the whole uh, story begins here, you take contents of PC, uh, that decides where in the memory instruction is located. So, you get the instruction from the memory, this is called uh, technically fetching the instruction. Uh, then for instruction like let us say uh, uh, add Okay. you read the registers okay, which will give you the operands. So, from a register file you read the values, the instruction then tells you what is to be done, whether addition is to be done, subtraction is to be done, comparison is to be done. Okay. So, you carry out that operation and uh, basically have these components, uh, I have shown connections roughly. Okay. So, so, you have PC which supplies the address for uh, a program which is stored in this which we are calling an instruction memory. Uh, from this we get the instruction. Uh, instruction has various fields, some fields specify registers, some sp fields specify operation to be performed and so on. So, uh, from different fields in the instruction we pick up the register addresses, access the values of registers, pass them on to let us say ALU for example, for performing the operation and uh, the, the result of ALU may have to be stored back in a destination register or in an instruction like uh, load or store, we may have to access data memory. A data memory accessing will require again address calculation. Okay, you need to add content of a register uh, with an offset which comes from the instruction. So, uh, we can possibly use same ALU for doing these things. So, uh, a constant may come from the instruction, register may come from register file, uh, this will provide address and uh, you may write into the data memory if it is a store instruction or read from the data memory if it is a load instruction. So, uh, the, these are the key components, we have talked extensively about ALU itself. Okay. Again while designing ALU, we looked at a few specific instructions for which we uh, made provision in the ALU and uh, the instruction I am talking of today were all, all covered in that. Uh, th there are other components uh, like PC, instruction memory or data memory we are going to see now also the register file. So, I will we'll come back to these components, <coughs> but on the whole one thing we need to keep in mind is that the design on the whole has two uh, major parts one is called the data path and the other is called controller. So, data path is the one, in fact what I had drawn was not the full design, I had drawn skeleton of the data path. So, data path is the one where you have uh, values or operands on which you are working. So, data flows here and data st is stored here. So, all calculations get done here, but uh, the other part which is the controller is the one which guides this, which actually controls this or instructs this. So, uh, controller is the one which will tell the ALU to perform addition, subtraction or comparison all right? and controller will instruct 
uh, memory whether it has to read or write and so on. So, each of the other components, each of the components in data path works under uh, instruction of the controller, but controller uh, for its own decision may look at some information coming from the data path. So, I have, I have shown these two kinds of uh, signal which flow from controller to data path and data path to controller. So, they are control signals which go from controller to data path and their status signal which come from data path to controller uh, which hel help controller in deciding the action. <coughs> so, now let us uh, look at the building blocks, uh, there are two types, one is the kind of elements which operate on data values, okay. we call them combinational elements and the other is uh, those which have state which contain some information uh, which we call state and these are called sequential elements. So, combination circuits have uh, output determined by the current input. Okay. So, so combinational circuit elements will look at the current inputs and uh, respond almost instantly to that. I am saying almost because there might be some delay, you remember that we talked about gate delays. Uh, but these have no memory, okay. whereas uh, elements which contain state which we called uh, sequential elements, they have memory, they remember what happened in the past and therefore, the output is function of the current input as well as the previous input. So, in some sense uh, the, the state contains, state represents a summary of uh, what this element has seen in past. So, summary of the previous input A is uh, actually contained in the state. So, strictly speaking the output of a sequential element is a function of the current input and the state, state encapsulates, state captures uh, the relevant part of the past. So, I will give some examples, uh, all gates are combinational circuits, okay. if you take AND gate depending upon what the input is it will uh, almost instantly react to the inputs uh, after uh, some small delay. So, in ideal case we assume 0 delay and say that the combination circuits have output function of the current input. So, various gates and or NAND or exclusive or inverter and so on all these are combination circuits. Multiplexer which makes choice between two or more inputs and uh, selects one of these to be available at the output. Uh, this is also a combination circuit. Decoder, decoder uh, is, is a circuit which looks at the bit pattern at the input and identifies the bit pattern. Suppose we talk of a 4 input decoder, so it will have 16 outputs and it will activate one of the outputs depending upon which one of the 16 combination is available at the input. Then components like adder, subtractor, comparator, ALU all these we have discussed, these are all combinational circuits. Okay. Uh, multipliers we discussed various designs, but the array multipliers which was simply a collection of uh, adders and other logic put together, uh, they, they are combinational circuits. The sequential multiplier which uh, goes through iterations using same adder is, is not a combinational circuit, that, uh, that anything which is not combinational circuit is a sequential circuit. So, we look at example of these, the most primitive ones are flip flops which have one bit of memory, okay. they can store a 0 or 1 depending upon uh, wh what value they contain at any given instant of time depending upon the signals which occurred in the past. Counters are sequential circuits, registers, so registers are extension of essentially flip flops in one dimension, okay. uh, register files and memories are extension of uh, flip flops in two dimensions. Okay. Uh, there, there is uh, some distinction between register files and memories, I will come to that later when we talk of components specific to uh, MIPS instruction set. Among the sequential circuits, we can have circuits which work with clock and those which do not work with clock. Okay. So, clocked state elements and unclocked state elements. In the clocked case, the 
changes in the state occur uh, with clock, whereas in unclocked elements they, they, they do not distinguish, but, uh, well the clocked elements have one of the inputs which is uh, playing a special role that is called clock, okay. whereas in unclocked elements uh, there is no input which is designated as clock and any change in any input can actually cause change in state. So, a, a clock as we know is a periodic signal and uh, uh, the period is called clock cycle time or clock period. Uh, typically one of the edges is assumed to be active edge. So, either the rising edge or the falling edge is considered as an active edge and uh, that, that is the edge which uh, causes the state transitions. All right. So, suppose in a particular design we are going with the convention of keeping the rising edge as active edge, then all uh, state changes in the clocked elements will take place with that rising edge. So, let us uh, look at a uh, little more details and look at examples of clocked and unclocked circuit. So, a simplest uh, unclocked element is uh, a, a latch. Okay. So, you, you take two NOR gates or two NAND gates and cross couple them. Okay. So, I suppose you would have studied this in digital electronics, so we do not need to uh, elaborate on this. Uh, so, so, this is a uh, unclocked R s latch, okay. so R stands for reset, S stands for set. So, when you uh, activate R, okay, this becomes 0 and this becomes 1, so it is in reset state, when you activate S, uh, this becomes 1 and this becomes 0. So, th there is a feedback loop here uh, through these cross coupled signals and actually uh, it is here the information gets stored. So, since there, there, there are two inversions in the path that provides it a, a stable storage. So, if this is 0, uh, this inversion brings a 1 here and that further gets inverted to get a 0 back here. So, uh, this is one stable state. Similarly, this 1 and that 0 is another stable state. So, a circuit like this can stay in this state. Uh, if as long as uh, you want provide there is no change in the input and uh, uh, the, the changes could occur because of uh, changes in R or changes in S. Uh, an extension of this is what is called a D latch where you put gates at the inputs. Okay. Uh, this is the D input or the data input and this is the clock input. So, although uh, we are calling one signal as a clock, but it is not clock in the sense of a clocked element, uh, because the changes can occur because the change is in D also in this case. So, normally suppose uh, D signal is changing like this and uh, uh, clock is like this, then what this circuit does is that while the clock is uh, in one state, okay, the output follows uh, the D input. Okay. When, when clock goes to 0, then uh, whatever was the state of this continues to be there and next change would possibly occur only when clock becomes 1 again. So, uh, at this point clock is becoming 1, but now the D input is 0, so it becomes 0. Uh, but, but you can analyze this and convince yourself that uh, while clock is high, Okay. If there is a change in D here, then the output will change. Okay. So, when clock is high, uh, you have 1 here and uh, depending upon uh, this uh, D, if this let us say become 0, you will get a 0 here and uh, uh, this becomes a 1. Okay. Uh, if d becomes 0, uh, there is an inversion here, right. Uh, so, you will get a 1 here, which means this will get flip flop will get reset. Okay. Uh, while uh, c is 1, again if d changes, it can change state. So, uh, during this period, q could change as many times as uh, d changes, but while q is 0, it uh, holds the last value. 
Okay, so you you can actually spend some time on this and analyze it further. Uh, you can get a clocked uh, D flip flop by putting two of these together. Okay, so we we take two D latches of the previous diagram and put them in this uh, form. One is uh, connected to C and other is connected to complement of C. Okay. So here uh, now this this can uh, this can change its state while C is one and D varies, okay. But those changes will be isolated here because at during that interval C will be zero here and therefore this will keep on holding the last value, right? So uh, eventually you will you can see changes here only when C goes from zero to one, okay. I am sorry, uh, C goes from 1 to 0 because this is uh, connected to C bar. So, it is a uh, falling edge triggered uh, uh, D flip flop, right. Uh, in, in fact, these uh, what I said as unclocked elements are sometimes called level triggered circuits because uh, this is active at one level of clock while C is 1, it is active, whereas uh, this one is active at least as seen from outside uh, at an edge. So, it is called edge triggered circuit. Uh, in our design, we are going to use uh, edge triggered circuits. Uh, edge triggered circuit as you see require uh, more hardware, okay. uh, but, but they give us a nice property that uh, <coughs> suppose a change occurs at some clock edge here. Okay. You see that change in Q and suppose through some path that change results in further change in D. Uh, but now since the clock edge is gone, that change will not affect it further. Okay. So, this is an important point to be noticed that imagine a D, D flip flop which is edge triggered and there is path through some combinational circuit from output of this back to D. So, that means uh, a change here can reflect uh, a change here. Okay. But now change at Q will be observed when clock has gone through an active edge. So let us say in falling edge in this, this case. So after clock has gone from one to zero, a, uh, a change appears here. Although that change may cause a change in D, but now since the clock edge has gone, that change will not cause trigger another change here. Okay. So so that is uh, that brings this uh, level of convenience here. Whereas in this case. Uh, if Q causes a change in D here, uh, while the clock is still active, because clock is active now in in uh, in an interval, uh, that could change for uh, that could cause further changes, and you know there could be uh, a period of instability. So now how uh, how how do the clock period relates to uh, the timing of the other uh, portion of circuit. So, we su suppose you have one state element and there is a path through combination circuit to another state element. Okay. Uh, this state element changes its state at one clock edge, let us say this clock edge and then those changes will uh, result in some changes at the input of this state element. Uh, this would notice those changes at the next clock edge okay because the clock edge for this uh, this clock edge would have gone and possibly caused some change but the change here in the element 2 resulting from the change in the element 1 here will actually occur here so uh, there is uh, this interval from this point to th this point in time which is allowed for signals to propagate through the combinational circuit so, so now depending upon what delays these circuits present, uh, we can have a fast clock or a slow clock or given a clock, we get a constraint on how much delay we can tolerate in these components or, or in this logic. Uh, there are some uh, timing constraints associated with the uh, sequential elements themselves. So, let us say this is the active edge of the clock, this is C of a D flip flop and this is the D input. So, now for a 
uh, for this value of d to be registered in the flip flop at this instant we would we want the 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 d flip flop would want it to be stable for some time before this instant and some time after that instant and these requirements are called setup time and hold time requirement so if if the change in d has occurred uh, just before this c too close to c uh, the d flip flop may find it too close to react and it may not be able to see the the recent value so we have to ensure that the change becomes stable at least this much interval before this instant and continues to be stable for that much period after this instant so there is, this is called the setup time that is called the hold time uh, if uh, d changes within this okay then the output could become unpredictable you won't know whether it, it takes the old value or it takes the new value okay or if you have a register containing many flip flops uh, uh, some, some flip flops may react fast some may not and therefore you may have a uh, a mixed up value so so this is an important consideration when we discuss the performance and timings okay so now uh, let's come back to those nine instructions which we want to implement uh, we want to uh, create a design for implementing those nine instructions and let's <coughs> carefully see what uh, components we are going to require to build the processor so we will require uh, uh, registers adder alu multiplexer register file program memory data memory and some additional components for bit manipulation so let's look at these one by one uh, we we need uh, a register to have the pc value program counter so this register implements the pc and uh, uh, all these all the sequential elements we will have as clock element so clock will be one input it will have 32 inputs uh, and 32 output 32 bit input 32 bit output so output will address uh, the program memory and the new value uh, which is going to cause change in the pc will be its input okay so now uh, at the active edge of the clock uh, pc will change its value okay how how this value comes and uh, when this clock edge occurs we will see when we put all the components together uh we will require adders and alus so alu design we have seen alu will perform main arithmetic and logical operation but uh we we need uh, addition operation in other situations also so for example uh to prepare pc for the next instruction you need to add 4 to the pc contents so P, uh, so this adder will perform uh, an addition of pc and a constant 4 okay so uh th this four expressed in 32 bits so there will be lots of zeros okay uh so so in fact uh, one, one could simplify the design of this adder noting that it has to add only a constant but let's not worry about that right now we'll see it later so we will just put an adder uh where we need to add pc and 4 okay uh, similarly we Uh, are likely to have need for adding an offset to uh, pc plus 4 for implementing branch instruction okay for for branch if uh, condition is true uh, you you are carrying out a relative branch that means uh, the, the offset which is specified by the instruction is added to the pc uh, but but we would have added 4 to pc by this time alu we have already seen okay it will take two 32 bit operand produce a result uh, and it will need to be told which operation is to be performed because we have designed it as a multi functional unit depending upon which instruction is being executed this may do different operations uh, this is also doing test for equality okay a equal to uh, b test is done the the result of slt will come in these 32 bits only but result of uh, uh, beq 
will be uh, a single bit which is to be used to decide whether to branch or not and uh, not we will not require this immediately, but when we uh, build the provision for exception handling we will require ALU also to tell us if there is any overflow or not. Uh, we would need multiplexers uh, perhaps at different points, but I am showing just one example here. Uh, multiplexer for example, may make a choice between uh, PC plus 4 and PC plus 4 plus offset. So, this is how for example, branch can be implemented right by, by making a choice of one of the two options. So, this is a crucial component register file. Now, uh, to take care of instructions like add, subtract and so on, we need two operands to come from register file and also the result has to go back to register file. So, this register file uh, is nothing but an array of flip flops, either you can think of it as two dimensional array of flip flops, right? a 32 by 32 array of flip flops or a one dimensional array of registers, okay, each register being 32 bits. So, so, in any case it has a total of 32 into 32 bits of storage <coughs> and uh, it has provision for reading two 32 bit values and writing one 32 bit value. So, these are two outputs uh, which have been labeled as read data 1 and read data 2 and uh, one input which is labeled as uh, write data. Okay. Uh, then the address of the register, which register you want to read or write is specified by these three inputs. Okay. So, uh, for the data which is being read out here, the address is specified here. Each of the address input is a 5 bit input because you have 32 registers. So, two addresses for read, one address for write and it is a sequential element. So, uh, a, a signal will come here to uh, clock it. Uh, this is program memory. <coughs> One could uh, work with a design which has a single memory for data and instruction or one could have separate one. So, in the initial design, we will assume two separate memories just to keep things simple. <coughs> the instruction memory is something from where we only read instructions, uh, we do not modify this. Okay. So, so the, the it has uh, one might debate whether it is a combinational element or a sequential element. Uh, memories are sequential elements, but uh, in this present context, uh, we will not be changing state of it. Okay. So, it, it will act like a combinational circuit, because uh, uh, we, we will assume that the contents of this are fixed, we are not changing it. So, so I am not showing any uh, clock input here. So, basically, uh, address will be supplied to it, address is an input, address which comes from program counter and out comes the instruction. So, uh, it, it responds uh, instantly to the input coming from the program counter, uh, much in the same way as a combinational circuit would do. <coughs> the memory which contains data uh, will have uh, data input and data output, read data and write data. Okay and uh, of course, address. So, here we assume that unlike register file where we would be doing read and write probably simultaneously within same instruction. As far as data memory is concerned as we notice that uh, there is a load instruction which only uh, reads from memory and there is a store instruction which writes into memory. So, we, we do not do both of these together and therefore, uh, we will have a single address input this will take care of reading as well as writing operation. <coughs> and uh, there are of course, uh, external inputs which uh, specify what is to be done, whether read is to be done or write is to be done. Uh, then we have uh, some miscellaneous kind of uh, circuit elements, which would be required to uh, put things together and complete the picture. For example, we require sign extension in many instructions. 
So, uh, Im imagine uh, the instruction which uh, performs load operation. So, the address calculation requires a 16 bit offset to be added to uh, contents of a register. So, now the 16 bit number uh, could be a positive or negative. So, before we add it to a 32 bit number, we need to do sign extension. So, so that it is a polarity is preserved. So, we, we need a circuit element which I am uh, denoting by this okay, 16 input and 32 output. Uh, it, it does not require any active components. All it needs is a particular way of wiring the inputs and output. So, as an illustration for 4 bits, okay, uh, suppose you are extending from 4 bit to 8 bits, all you need to do is the the MSB of the 4 bits needs to be repeated so many times. Okay, so, so this is the in, these 4 bits are input, 8 bits are output and you would notice that this particular bit which was MSB earlier gets now replicated and is available as uh, the upper 4 bits apart from that itself. Okay, uh, shifting, so in particular shifting by 2 uh, or multiplication by 4 which is required when you when you take uh, uh, offsets which are for branch addresses. So, in BEQ instruction if you recall that 16 bit offset which you have is actually a word offset. Okay. So, to get the equivalent byte offset you need to multiply it by 4. So, multiplying by 4 is nothing but shifting by 2 and this also does not require uh, any active element, any gate, all you need to do is wire it in a particular manner. So, suppose you have 8 bits and you want to shift it by 2. So, the output will have 6 of the bits connected to the 6 of the bits here and these 2 bits will be uh, hardwired to 0. So, uh, now we, we are ready with all these components uh, to be put together and in the next lecture we will take up uh, this task of putting these together in a manner that the instructions can be correctly executed. So, to summarize we uh, began by looking at the uh, simple subset of instructions for which we want to design the processor. We took 9 instructions and uh, we uh, uh, looked at the concept of designing uh, the system in terms of data path and control. The whole thing is divided into data path and control. We looked at the building blocks, uh, how they are distinguished, how com uh, combinational circuits are distinguished from sequential circuits, how sequential circuits are uh, classified as clocked or unclocked. Okay. And we uh, looked at generic examples of uh, combinational sequential circuits. We, we looked at the clock and timing issues, okay. what are the time constraints posed by clock period or uh, uh, what, what are the constraints posed by the circuit delay uh, on the clock period. And then we looked at specific circuits which are required to build uh, MIPS processor namely register, multiplexer, adder, ALU, register file, program memory and data memory. Okay, I will stop with this. Mm -hmm.